This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the modern research platform for leading investors. Tired of running your own expert calls to get up to speed on a company? Tegas lets you ramp faster and find answers to critical questions more efficiently than any alternative method. The gold standard for research, the Tegas platform delivers unmatched access to timely, qualitative insights through the largest and most differentiated expert call transcript database. With over 60,000 transcripts spanning 22,000 public and private companies, investors can accelerate their fundamental research process by discovering highly differentiated and reliable insights that can't be found anywhere else in the market. As a listener, drive your next investment thesis forward with Tegas for free at tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers, or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down the data services giant Equifax. Now, historically, I thought of Equifax as a credit bureau. And you have Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion that built this fascinating oligopoly worth studying. But the business has extended well beyond the credit checks on mortgages. And their employee verification tool, the work number, might actually be the crown jewel asset today. So to break down Equifax, I'm joined by Mo Spolin, analyst at White's Investments. And we get into both businesses, the unique industry structures that they sit in, the history around competition, and the outlook from here. And one quick note before we transition to the episode, the newest podcast from Colossus, The Art of Investing, is dropping next week. This is going to be a series of discussions with the world's best investors, company builders, academics, perhaps athletes, artists, any human beings devoted to exploring the joys of compounding in all its forms. And we're dropping our initial episode with Berkshire's Todd Combs next week. Make sure to subscribe through the link in the show notes right now. So you can hit pause and subscribe. And you will hear much more about the origins of that podcast and our partners, Rick and Paul, through the link and the trailer. Now, please enjoy this breakdown of Equifax. All right, Mo, pumped to have you here on Business Breakdowns, Equifax is a super interesting business because I think it has a lot of characteristics that people write about in terms of business frameworks. It has a deep history. It gets qualified in all these different categories, like being a monopoly and having these really interesting moats. But I also don't think it's the most obvious name or well understood name from outsiders. So maybe we could just start there. Could you give the simplest explanation for what Equifax does as a business, and then we can roll from there? Thanks for having me on, Matt. I'm a listener, very grateful and excited to be here. Yeah, Equifax is one of the three major credit bureaus alongside Experian and TransUnion. The way the credit bureau business model works is that it's a give-to-get-tory data repository. Lenders and creditors of all sorts will contribute the borrowing and repayment history of their customers to the bureaus. In return for contributing that data, the bureaus can pay for the right to pull a credit report or a credit file, as it's called, on a consumer to inform the origination of credit. In addition to the credit bureau business that Equifax is in, it also has the predominant verification of income and employment business. That's called the work number, abbreviated to TWN or TWIN. Resident in twin is the income and employment information of 120 million Americans. That compares to approximately 160 million Americans on the non-farm payroll and 220 million Americans that have an income stream of any source. Relative to the credit bureau side of the business, the work number faces much less competition and has a much longer unit growth runway. Therefore, 
the work number business is faster growing and higher margin. And it's really the focal point of the story going forward. Interestingly, although Equifax is primarily recognized as a credit bureau, first and foremost, the work number is in the Equifax Workforce Solutions EWS segment. That's the largest segment at 45% of revenue. The next largest segment is USIS, United States Information Solutions, and then also the international segment, which is a portfolio of credit bureaus. So TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax also compete across the globe. And EWS, the verification segment, accounts for about 45% of revenue and closer to 60% of EBITDA, while the bureau businesses make up the rest of the mix. So it's really interesting because I think I mostly associate Equifax with being the credit bureau and that credit bureau being the monopoly. But as I just heard there, it sounds like that is actually a more competitive market than what they're doing in the workforce solutions business. So I still want to get into the credit bureau and the history of that market because it has such an interesting industry structure and how all these different pieces play into it. It's unlocked a huge market in terms of lending in the US and I think globally and just standardize the process, which has been so valuable. So maybe we can start back at the origin story of how this all came together and specifically how Equifax came out a winner in this because I'm sure they weren't the only ones providing these services and I'm sure there was much more than three at the get-go. Yeah, so Equifax was actually founded in 1899 under the name The Retail Credit Company by a couple of brothers named Guy and Cater Wolford in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In the early part of the 20th century, the credit bureau industry was sort of the Wild West. There was very little or zero regulation on the collection, sharing, and usage of consumer data. The industry was highly fragmented, all paper-based before the advent of computers and digitized records. So there would be multiple bureaus. They were hardly even bureaus within each population center in each town in the U.S. And it would essentially be an organization that would go around to creditors of different types and ask them about their customers and how credit worthy those customers were. They paid their bar tabs on time. Yeah. And even went into things like their personal lives, their romantic lives. And of course, this will become a more relevant point to keep in mind as we think about how the industry eventually consolidated later on. The two Wolford brothers, they were grocers and they wanted to come up with a way to understand how credit worthy potential customers of theirs were in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. And they went around to other grocers in the area and asked them information about the borrowing and repayment history, sort of, I suppose, on trade credit or something like that, buying groceries. And they compiled a notebook. And it was the same general idea where the creditors would contribute freely and then pay to pull the file to inform the origination of credit. Throughout the first half of the 20th century into the 1960s, the retail credit company expanded pretty rapidly. It opened over 300 offices across the country. And then in the 1970s, there were two things, two dynamics that really begot the consolidation in the industry. Number one was the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Equal Opportunity Credit Act, which were enacted in the early 1970s. And these provided much more stringent regulation around how data could be collected and stored and used. And the rationale behind these regulations were to try to make credit decisioning more objective. And rather than making credit origination decisions based on age, race, personal life, romantic life, et cetera, it would be more codified. And this is also how FICO plays into the story. I believe the former guest, Dev Cantaseria, mentioned this. FICO is a very simple abstraction that's indisputable in what it says. And that's how it sort of standardized itself as the language or the currency in the modern consumer credit economy. In any case, the regulations made it much more difficult for just kind of a mom and pop bureau to really exist. And this, I think, pushed a lot of exit out of the industry. In addition to this, there was 
of course, the advent of digitized computerized record storage. And this allowed bureaus to both collect data from all over the country and serve creditors all over the country because the data could be transmitted electronically rather than physically in paper form. And between the 1970s and the 1990s, the industry consolidated quite a bit until we're left with the three-headed oligopoly we have now. Equifax, a couple last things to point out about Equifax. First of all, how it became Equifax was following the passage of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or FICRA. The retail credit company had had a few repeated violations, and in the effort to change its course, it changed its name to Equitable Factual Information. And so Equifax is a portmanteau of equitable factual information. I love that. And Equifax then did over 100 acquisitions in the 1980s, different bureaus combined and sort of amalgamated into what we now know as TransUnion and Experian, and we're left with the industry structure we have today. And in the give to get model, you're essentially handing over your data, which has some value, but it has a ton more value when it's grouped together with everyone else's data. But you're also paying at the same time then to access that conglomerate combined data source that doesn't fully bake out to me just in terms of the logic. So is it you only have access if you're also giving data or what got them the ability to set up the model in that way? Yeah, so I think there's two things to keep in mind. Yes, generally, it's a give to get model. In other words, that in order to be able to pull the credit file on a consumer, you have to be a contributor of data yourself. That gives rise to a network effect. It would be very difficult for an entrant to come into the industry and ask a creditor and say, hey, give us your borrowing and repayment data. And they're going to say, well, what do you have for us in return? And they're going to say, we have no data. So it's sort of a chicken and an egg problem. Now, as to why the credit file actually has utility or efficacy in the credit decisioning process, it's because if you take most full in, I've probably worked with many different creditors throughout my life. So it's both longitudinal and cross-sectionally exhaustive. And as long as an individual has worked with more than one creditor at any point throughout their entire life, then the creditor that they go to currently for a decision isn't going to have a full view into that person's borrowing and repayment history. One of the actually originally intended consequences of recording all this information was that it has kind of a positive incentive effect, meaning that if you take out a loan, you know that you're going to have to pay it back. You can't just disappear off the map and not face any consequences. So it's kind of a positive benefit to society just knowing. It's almost like having a judicial system, so to speak, as far as being a good borrowing citizen. Checks and balances, yes, makes the uh, world go round. And in terms of the evolution of this business, the oligopoly, FICO's come into play. How big of a market is that today? And... Should I just think about that as something that's generally tied to the amount of credit that's in the system, which I think has just generally been substantially growing over the years? Is there anything else unique related to that specific business? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's a little bit difficult to discern with precision, but I would guess the collective revenues of just the US credit bureaus of those three companies is probably in the range of $5 billion. If you look at the international businesses, it might be close to double that. The way you can think about these businesses is it's a per transaction revenue model, meaning that customers only pay when a record is returned. And so the unit equation for the business would be end market units. We can take mortgages multiplied by penetration, i.e. the percentage of the time that the file is pulled when a mortgage is originated, multiplied by the hit rate, the percentage of the time the record is present. So just to put that into numbers, if there were 100 mortgages originated out of those mortgages, a hundred of those mortgages, the creditor actually tries to pull the file. And then 90 to 95% of the time, the file is going to have the record. And so that would equate to 90 to 95 units for the credit bureau business. As we think about the structure of the industry, if most bowling goes and applies for a mortgage and the creditor um, is deciding whether to look at my pull the credit file on most bowling from Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian, most of the data, almost probably all of the data on most Bolin is going to be the same across any of those three bureaus. And that's because that would be the case if any of the 
prior creditors I'd ever worked with in my life had contributed to all three bureaus. And so because of that, the file data is sort of commoditized. There's definitely really immense entry barriers to the industry. I'm almost certain there's not going to be a fourth bureau for the network effect reasons and just so highly regulated. I think the bureaus generally, because the penetration rate and the hit rate are close to 100%, they're just going to grow at credit origination volumes, at least in the US. And credit origination volumes are going to grow largely close to the rate of GDP through the cycle. Obviously, there will be ups and downs. If you look internationally, for example, TransUnion has an enviable position leading in the Indian credit economy. Experian also owns the largest credit bureau in Brazil called Sarasa. Those are modernizing credit economies, meaning that lenders are just kind of acclimating to and standardizing on pulling the credit file for each credit decision. And so in more modernizing credit economies, there can definitely be like a pretty strong premium to GDP type growth. But in the US, it's fairly saturated, maybe a point or two above GDP. And there's some similarities to the corporate credit market where you have Moody's, S&P and Fitch placing the credit ratings on the individual issuers. But what makes that somewhat unique is that most credit fund mandates only require two of three ratings. So most corporate only get two credit ratings and Fitch seems to be the one who's usually on the outside looking in. Is there anything unique like that going on here in this industry? Are all three euros used for these mortgage polls, or is there anything that's a general rule of thumb when it comes to who gets used? Conventionally, the standard in the mortgage industry has been what's called a tri-merge, which is that if a mortgage originator wanted to securitize a mortgage to Fannie, Freddie, Ginny Mae, et cetera, they would have to pull the file from all three bureaus. And so essentially, I don't know if this is even a formal word, it was basically a triopoly. Because if there were 100 mortgages originated, there would be 300 units sold by all of the bureaus. All of the bureaus would have 100% share because all of them are mandated. And that afforded the bureaus some pricing power in the mortgage industry. Interestingly, the Federal Housing and Financing Agency in late 2022 came out with a ruling that it wanted to transition to a buy-merge report, whereby only two of the three files would be required for agency mortgages. Creditors will still have the option of pulling three files and not just two. And the reason for that is the agencies will still be pulling all three files. And so let's say Mo goes to apply for a mortgage and the originator only pulls the file from Experian and TransUnion and then securitizes that to Fannie. But then Fannie sees that on my Equifax file, which the creditor didn't pull, there's an unpaid auto loan. In that case, the originator would be subject to repurchase risks and might have to buy back the mortgage from the agency. And so the incremental cost of buying the file is probably not worth taking the repurchase risk. The cost of the file varies on the different use cases. So the file is going to be more expensive the higher the value of the loan. The mortgage credit report is going to be more expensive than the auto credit report, which will be more expensive than the credit card auto report. And also the credit bureaus, the three of them started a joint venture in 2006 called Vantage Score that was created to be a competitor to FICO. It really hasn't gotten much traction. It's the first I heard of it. So yeah, I know it's interesting when I talk to potential customers or other folks in the industry, most of them haven't even heard of it. And actually it makes me think about how investors oftentimes think a lot more about risks that might be out there than people actually living in the industry day to day ever really encounter from a practical standpoint. But in any case, Vantage Score was created to be competitive with FICO. The reason for that was that FICO is effectively a monopoly supplier to the three bureaus. And FICO has been mandated in for agency mortgages as well, historically, since 1995. That's actually, it's FICO's mandate at that time is sort of what precipitated its ubiquitous adoption. Lenders wanted to standardize on a single scoring methodology. So once they adopted it for mortgage, they adopted it across auto, card, et cetera. In any case, the bureaus wanted to come up with an alternative to FICO so that they wouldn't have supplier concentration. And Vantage Score 
does have pretty good uptake in non-origination use cases. So for example, it's used in Credit Karma. So it will be used in things like mailing leads or portfolio reviews. If you ever check your mailbox and you have an offer for a credit card, in all likelihood, the originator used Vantage Score to decide if you qualify. For example, they could go to Vantage Score and say, hey, show me everyone with over a 720 Vantage and I'm going to send them a mailer. Interestingly, the Vantage Score is on the same scale as FICO, but it's not exactly fungible, meaning a 740 Vantage is not equivalent to a 740 FICO. So Vantage really hasn't gotten much uptake on the origination side, but it was mandated for usage on the mortgage side, coincident with this regulation to transition to the buy merge. So the way the industry has sort of shaken out is that there's three industry data aggregators, and then there's a single kind of scoring mechanism. And I would analogize FICO as more comparable to S&P and Moody's of the world. In the mortgage industry, traditionally, three files have been mandated, and that basically afforded this triopoly structure, as I've termed it. In card and auto, the creditor really only has to use one file. I mean, they don't technically have to use anything, but because they want to be prudent lenders. And in other words, in Card and Auto, there's no governing GSE that's saying you need to use X, Y, or Z score or process to securitize your paper to us. But it's just generally accepted practice that creditors will use a credit file and a FICO score to originate card and auto loans. And so outside of mortgage, generally, there's a waterfall structure where the creditor will give 60 to 70% of its business to one of the bureaus. And then the second and third bureaus in that cascade will pick up the scraps if there's any missing data points from the first provider. But generally speaking, because the data on the file is pretty similar, if not almost exactly identical between the bureaus, creditors will basically bake off the bureaus for the top waterfall positioning outside of mortgage. And then as I was talking about with mortgage, it's kind of up in the air whether we'll transition from the try to the buy merge. And it would be pretty bad for the industry if the buy merge comes to bear, if originators elect to go that route, just because as yet, they've essentially had no unit or price competition. If only two are mandated, that really could facilitate sort of a price war, potentially, so as to not be the one excluded bureau. And so that's how the industry shakes out today. And what percentage of the business is split between mortgages, auto, and card? Yeah, that's sort of, that takes more guesswork. But historically, I would guess that the mortgage business is probably approximately 25%. And then the remainder, it will just be made up of a bunch of different use cases, auto, credit card, personal loans, telcos, utilities. And I guess... With that in mind, 25% of the bureau business, even if you were to go from the triopoly in your terms to just basically having some competition for which two out of the three are going to be used, it's not as massive of an impact if it's 25% of 45% of your revenue. It's a little bit less meaningful than I would have expected when I was first looking at this business. Yeah. I do wonder, mortgage might be 25% of revenue, but it could be... uh somewhat meaningfully higher percentage of the segment's profits just because there's much less competition in the vertical historically. And also the mortgage vertical is really the only industry in which the Bureau kind of had some pricing power. And so it also might have fueled some of that above GDP growth. And so in sort of the worst case scenario, the Bureaus could lose units and lose pricing power at the highest margins within the segment. Good counter to me downplaying the risk there. Well, yeah, yeah. When you look at this segment before we jump to the work number and just think about how it has historically trended from both a revenue standpoint and from a margin standpoint, is it a cyclical business that when you have a global financial crisis, I'm sure there's a lot less mortgage activity going on and just general credit activity. Do you see this business tend to move with GDP in terms of top line? And then what does the margin profile look like within this segment over time? Is there any meaningful expansion or detraction? Yeah, actually, the business off the top of my head, the bureau industry was not actually down as badly as you would have imagined during the great financial crisis. 
top line was, I think, only down in the single digit range. The bureau business definitely is cyclical. I mean, it's very levered to mortgage activity. So revenue just took off in 2020 relative to 2019. On the margin front, I think this is adjacent to a discussion on the breach, but USIS used to run at high 40s, even touching 50% EBITDA margins. That's all the way down to the mid 30s today. I think in years past, the company had underinvested in IT and was sort of over earning on account of that. And then it's really invested very, very heavily to completely rewrite its IT architecture on uh, Google Cloud Platform. And so that's been a margin bad guy, along with the mortgage headwinds that we're now experiencing have also been a headwind to margins. And so I would think if USIS margins are going to be 35-ish in 2023, I would think that as the IT project concludes, which should be early 24 timeframe, and the mortgage market bounces back, I would think about USIS normalized EBITDA margins being closer to the 40% range, but that's not proven yet. The company does have to kind of take back five, six points of margin. Yeah, super interesting. And we're definitely going to get to the breach as we continue the discussion. I want to transition to the work number and this business, which I think from the outside doesn't get me putting myself into the consensus category doesn't get as much attention, at least in terms of what I know Equifax for, but it seems to be the crown jewel or that's the perception within the business. So maybe describe a little bit about how this came to be and what exactly is happening within the work number. Yeah, it's interesting. I think if you mention Equifax to an investor, immediately they think of the Bureau and they might not know there's really much else going on, but much more than half of incremental revenue and incremental earnings over the next many years will be coming from the Equifax workforce solution segment. So that's really the key driver of the business going forward. Equifax acquired a company called Tox Corporation in 2007. That's spelled T-A-L-X. It's an interesting kind of circuitous history as to how Tox eventually emerged into this dominant information services provider. And so to take you back in time a little bit, Tox was started in the 1970s as a business process outsourcing operation. It would do HR paperwork on behalf of large enterprises across the country. So it would do things like unemployment claims, I-9s, opportunity tax credits, et cetera. In order to do the paperwork, the enterprise customers had to share their payroll data. And so before Twin emerged and was this automated means by which verifiers could authenticate consumer information, the way that mortgage originators, creditors, background screeners, et cetera, would try to verify where you worked and how much you made was simply just to call your employers. And this, as you can imagine, would be very arduous and disruptive to the verifier. And so what happened was a customer of Talks, it was McDonnell Douglas in the 1990s, they said to Talks, you already have all our payroll data why don't you just start answering these calls from verifiers and we'll pay you for it. We don't want to do it anymore. And so Tox then went and set up call centers and started fielding these calls on behalf of employers from verifiers. And then Tox got wise to the idea that it should actually flip its business model on its head. And what it would do is it would digitize and automate the data into a database that verifiers, for example, a mortgage originator could ping instantly and that way they wouldn't have to wait to push through their loan. And then they would give the service away for free to the contributing employer. And so Talks then took that value proposition to the rest of the Fortune 500 1000 for which it was not doing the HR paperwork and said, hey, just contribute your data to us and you won't have to answer calls anymore. And through that motion, Talks really by the time it was acquired by Equifax in 2007 had a uh, contributing relationship with north of 95% of the Fortune 500. So at this point today, substantially every large enterprise in the US contributes its records directly to the work number business. And what does the competition look like in this market? Is it similar to the Bureau where you have others that are fairly big? So I think the way I think about competition and also to keep 
filling in color on the work number. So the work number has 120 million income and employment information, which I'll just call a record for short going forward on 120 million Americans. Large enterprises, Fortune 500, 1,000 might employ about 50 to 60 million folks. And Equifax has about a 45% mix of its records coming from direct corporate contributors, which equates to about 55 million records. There's 160 million people on the non-farm payroll, 220 million Americans who make money at all. And so in order to keep populating out its database to get more coverage, Equifax has partnered with payroll processors. Now, in the payroll processor market, Equifax will say that substantially all of its contributing relationships are exclusive, except for that with ADP. It won't call out ADP by name, but it's fairly well understood that ADP is the single payroll processor that shares with competitors. And ADP is the largest processor that has 25 million records. And so when you think about the fact the work number has 120 million records in some, net out the direct corporate contributing you're at, you're left with 65 million. You net out the 25 million from ADP and you have 40 million records from remaining payroll processors that are exclusive. That would also imply that 95 million of Equifax's 120 million records are exclusive to itself. So the reason that the direct corporate contributors will share with Equifax exclusively, I think is basically threefold. Number one, it's sensitive employee information. And so they don't want to share the data with more parties than they have to. I know it's sort of ironic saying that in context of Equifax being the lucky party to have it after its breach. Wasn't going to go there. Yep, not (laughs) yet. But So I think also Equifax is considered the standard in the verification space. It's the only one that's really been doing it for a meaningful period of time. It has quite an appreciable head start and lead. And so it's just kind of accepted practice that it would be okay to share with Equifax. That's number one. Number two is Equifax, and we'll get into this, I think, in more detail, but Equifax has by far the largest verifier footprint, meaning that if an enterprise shared its record with Experian, for example, it likely wouldn't be offloading any incremental verification requests. And then thirdly, Equifax with its HR paperwork, which it calls its employer services makes the relationship stickier. When we think about the processors, it really relates to the fact that this is a network business in the sense that Equifax, because it has the largest verifier footprint, it can offer the greatest revenue share to the payroll processors. And so the way that the contracts work with the processors is that Equifax will pay a revenue share. My understanding is it's probably in the ballpark of about 20% of the verification fee. And so to kind of bring this to life, for example, let's say Mo works at Fund ABC. Fund ABC uses ADP as its payroll processor. If Mo goes to try to get a mortgage from Wells Fargo and Wells Fargo uses the work number and Wells Fargo pings the twin database on Mo Spolin, and then the ADP record will be pulled, Equifax will send over the information that might cost about 50 bucks to the originator. And then Equifax would pass 10 bucks back to ADP. And because Equifax has such a larger breadth of verifiers in its network, it just offers much more revenue share to the processors. And that's why they're willing to share exclusively. And I understand that the work number is kind of the one-stop shop, but ADP is not small as the payroll processor. And they do represent a large percentage of employees who would need to be verified for whatever reason. Is this a service that ADP has ever considered offering in any way themselves? It seems like if you could just collect 100% rather than 20%, it's an interesting option. Yeah. So I think a couple of different forks to go off of that. I would say from ADP and all the processors standpoint, I think the way they think about it is it's just 100% margin revenue stream. They don't have to stand up any infrastructure. They don't have to create any verifier relationships. I think about it almost as like their data set being more extensible in the way that they just find one more way to monetize it at 100% margin. I think this also feeds into the competitive situation in the verification of income and employment space. So Experian also, I estimate, has about 10 million exclusive records. 
And then there's a third private company called TrueWork, which has a partnership with an investment from TransUnion. And that company might have about 5 million records exclusive to itself. So the way I segment the market is Equifax has 95 million exclusive. ADP shares with all vendors. That's another 25. Experian has 10 and TrueWork has five. And so you would think about maybe about 135 million records have been aggregated. The delta between 135 and the 220 million Americans who make money is kind of the record growth runway. Similarly to the bureau business, verifiers will kind of stack rank the different vendors because even if Experian only has 10 million records, which is just my estimate to be clear, those are still 10 million records that you don't need to go calling that person's former employers. And so the way that it would work, an originator would, or a verifier of any sort, would basically probably first ping the twin database, then perhaps Experian, then perhaps TrueWork. And the vendor with the most exclusive records is generally going to be placed at the top of the waterfall. Because even though ADP is shared with all the vendors, because Equifax has all of those direct corporate contributors and for now, all these exclusive payroll contracts, it will be pinged first. And when most Bullen walks into a mortgage branch to take out a loan, the lender doesn't know whether he works at a company that uses ADP or one of the processors that's exclusive or a large enterprise that's a direct contributor, et cetera. So they just transmit my social security number, in essence, to the work number database. And then the work number returns a record. And even if it is from ADP, then the work number still captures that because it's at the top of the waterfall. I think so long as Equifax and the work number continue to have by far the most exclusive records, they'll remain at the top of the waterfall. That makes sense. And I assume the pricing is no different for Equifax or Experian because if I am someone that's doing a lot of verification... And I noticed that there's different pricing in both ADPs in both databases. I might switch the waterfall around in order to hit that. Is there any pricing competition there that takes place? For most of its history, the work number hasn't really had to contend with much or any competition at all. But with Experian coming into the market, what the work number has done is offer a discount to be placed at the top of the waterfall, which I think more strategically is viewed, would be viewed as the fact that the work number charges a much higher price if it's relegated behind Experian. And so it just becomes kind of a weighted average math calculation as to, okay, Experian might have a little bit of a discount to Equifax just because it's the new entrant. It has to convince the lender there's a reason for it to switch. But the more often that you're relegating the work number and then therefore the more often you're paying the higher price because you're still going to the work number because it's the one that has the exclusive record a significant percentage of the time, then even if you get a small discount because you hit ADP with Experian, your all-in cost as the verifier ends up being higher because you're paying a higher price to the work number from the second position. So I'm curious about this. How do they audit that they are the second position on the waterfall. Is there some type of system that's tracking this? Yeah, I will say my experience with the Equifax team is that they're super analytically driven. So I wouldn't be surprised. They are in the information services business after all. So I wouldn't be surprised if they've come up with certain ways to track that share change. And I think it might even be just a threat. Like, hey, if we notice that our share is falling off in a way that doesn't correspond to just our estimate of end market volumes, you're going to start seeing higher prices when you do come to us. On the exclusive stuff. Yeah. So what is protecting them is the breadth of data and the percentage of the industry that they have a control on. But the actual switching costs for someone who's looking for verification isn't necessarily high in terms of pinging out. Yeah, I wouldn't think about... I, I would probably more than trivial, but I wouldn't say the switching cost is the primary consideration. I think particularly in the mortgage space where Equifax and the work number is most established, I think there is an appetite for additional verification providers. The problem the verifiers have is that no one else has the data in size. And so it even generally gets to the extent where if a company is contributing its data to 
the work number directly, say Amazon, or if your ADP will go to market and say, use our solution, you don't have to answer calls from verifiers anymore. That's like bundled into being an ADP payroll customer. And so if a bank says, you know, I'm sick and tired of paying this monopoly supplier, i.e. the work number, I'm going to try to call these companies and just have them send the data manually like the old fashioned way. A lot of times the employer will just say, we don't do that. If you want the information, go to the work number. Not to mention that I think it's sort of a situation where there's more resentment than logic in it, in that even if the work number is taking price in a way that reflects its competitive standing, I think Equifax is very rigorous about quantifying the value that they're providing. They'll always say they price the value, value-based pricing. And so I think they have ways of thinking about, okay, well, how much faster is your conversion rate? on your mortgage loans, how much cost you take out by not having to call around employers, et cetera, and essentially just price to capture that surplus. And so it would probably not be rational for verifiers to really go back to manual processes unless Equifax doesn't have the record. Yeah, yeah. The manual process, I think, has probably (laughs) lost the Experian move into the market. They have a long way to go to capture all of that data that Equifax has. I'll just add one more thing. I think both Experian and TrueWork understand that it's going to be nearly impossible to replicate the record database that Equifax has. It's been in the business for so much longer and has such a large lead at this point. But if you think about the fact that Equifax, the work number has 120 million records out of 220 million Americans who make money, that's only about a 55% hit rate. And so there is still a substantial percentage of the verification request that can't be fulfilled by twin. And I think that's where TrueWork and also Experian can carve out a business. I think both from the customer standpoint and the business model economics of it, the instant database, i.e. what twin has, where the verifier just pings the database and instantly gets an answer, that's the best business model and best for the customer. But there's still a lot of records out there. And so I think Equifax and probably now Experian are really racing to try to aggregate the rest of those records and sign them up exclusively. But I think my view is for TrueWork, I mean, their unit TAM is sort of shrinking every quarter as Equifax adds more records. And I would imagine, I think in the end state of the industry, I think Experian is a legitimate competitor. They have kind of the capital structure to compete with Equifax. And I think they'll probably get a fair share of the incremental records that are out there that haven't been signed up. Now, Equifax, the contract partnerships are three to five years. As those come up for renewal, it's possible that Experian could win some of those. I think um, the issue for Experian, again, they just can't offer the same revenue share. But it wouldn't surprise me if Experian makes a little dent too. I think as long as the records remain exclusive to each verification provider, then it's almost like each vendor will have a mini monopoly. There won't really be sort of a regional local monopoly, I should say, kind of like the cable business in a way, is that there wouldn't be any really record overlap. So there wouldn't be any direct competition introduced. I think when you think about the incentives today, the processors are also incentivized to keep the market highly concentrated or monopolized because that provides uh, pricing power to the work number. And if the processors are participating in a revenue share, they don't want the price of the verification request to get competed down. So they really have no interest in opening up the market to multiple players. But I think what could end up happening would be that the processors sort of partition the exclusive rights more finely. So a processor might say, okay, well, Equifax, you get mortgage talent and government exclusively, but we're going to give tenant screening or auto screening exclusively to Experian. And still, I think in that way, that would allow the processors to kind of have their cake and eat it too. That way they could get kind of full, realize the revenue from full volumes and not introduce price competition into the market. I think that would be at least the most rational end state for the industry. And today... What does the margin profile look like for this business and how has that trended over time? So when Equifax acquired talks, the mix in the business, it was actually more than 50% the HR paperwork 
BPO operation. And that's largely a commodity service-based business that I would estimate probably operates at 10% operating margins, if not less. Whereas the work number is this very high, build it once, sell many times information distribution business with very low marginal costs. And so the verification work number database has much higher margins. And so as the work number database revenue line, technically termed verification services within EWS has outgrown the HR paperwork business, then the margins of the total segment have mixed up quite significantly. So actually, when Tox was originally acquired by Equifax. The business had actually high teens, EBITDA margins. That's mixed all the way up to north of 50% today. And again, the paperwork, HR paperwork business is really just there strategically as a way to source and retain records. Got it. Okay. So putting it all together in the business, a lot of this, it sounds like from both sides of things, is just tied to general macro. You're going to have more things pulled in good economies, more borrowing. I guess there's some tie to job changes and different things related to employment. But when you put it all together as a business, how do you frame the forward outlook for something like this? Top line at some level of GDP, margin profile, how does that change? How do you look at it as an investor? You're exactly right on the bureau side that it is basically a GDP, GDP plus grower. I think that the work number business has a significant amount of white space ahead just from an idiosyncratic structural business model perspective to grow. And the reason for that is, again, if we think back about hit rate and penetration, the work number still only has 120 million records. I made an estimate, maybe 135 million are aggregated in some. The growth between that 135 and 220, every time Equifax adds a record, that's instantly monetized because it's already getting the pings from the verifiers. And so Equifax is still growing records, high single digits, low double digits. I think that will decelerate as the number of available records naturally just declines. But for perspective, since Talks was acquired 16 years ago, it's grown records 6 to 7% annually. So I still think there's a pretty long runway to grow records mid-single digit plus. And what's unique about the business is that it basically has two vectors to grow units, records and penetration. So We just covered records. If we move over to penetration, on the penetration side, in mortgage, the work number is most highly penetrated at about 60 to 65%. It was mandated by the GSEs following the great financial crisis when it was the whole no income, no job application craze, but it's still not at 100%. I think the work number will still keep chugging along and mortgage coming closer to 100 over time. They've increased that penetration by about 10 points from 55-ish to 65-ish over the last three or four years. So just keep kind of chugging that along. And then I think the key kind of growth bet for the business is on the talent and the government penetration and uptake. So in those verticals, the penetration rate is really only 20, 25%. Just kind of quickly on each of those. In talent right now, Twins gets almost all of its distribution through the three public background screeners which are First Advantage, Higher Right, and Sterling, those three all together have about 30 to 35% share of background screens in the US. And they're taking share in a very fragmented industry. They're the most technologically enabled. They're competing with regional mom and pops, et cetera. And so they take a few points of share every year. That flows through directly to twin penetration. And then also... Whereas the twin penetration talent is 20, 25%, but the market share of the three screeners is 30, 35%. That delta is because twin historically has only been used for white collar screens just because of its price point and the robustness of the data. So recently, Equifax has come out with a couple of products to try to increase penetration in the more blue collar workforce verifications there. And so really the motions within talent are to one start servicing all the blue collar screens commissioned by those public background screeners. Because right now, First Advantage, et cetera, they are commissioning or conducting background screens for blue collar jobs. They're just having to do them manually because Twin hasn't had a blue collar kind of portfolio of SKUs until more recently. And then also 
partnering with all the other background screeners out there in the country that have more, have the remaining 65, 70% share that the public players don't have. And then on government, it's a very fragmented industry. There's thousands of agencies at the state and federal levels, which disperse benefits. And so it's really just kind of, I think, a blocking and tackling sales motion on the government side, just having folks at all the different state capitals selling the agencies on the value proposition of doing things instantly rather than manually. And so I think when you add up records and penetration across the three end markets, I do think there's a pretty credible case for growing units 10% plus. And then on price, the work number has historically been considered pretty aggressive in its pricing. As discussed, I think the company will continue to take some pure price really up until the point it makes sense to use an alternative if an alternative is really even feasible. And then also increasingly, the work number is selling more SKUs with historical records that come at a higher price point and also education and incarceration data. So via acquisition and partnership, Aquifax has also built out 90 plus percent coverage of incarceration records and then 99% plus coverage of secondary degree data. And so those data sets are particularly useful in talent and government. And so as those data sets are monetized more of the time, that's also an ASP uplift. So there's more of sort of like a structural driver to price as well. And so I think when you put it all together, the work number business does have a strong case to grow solidly double digits for quite a long time. And that would be consistent with the way the company frames it to the market. But all things together, when you add in the bureau business, I think about the US bureau business probably growing mid single digits, the international business growing a little more quickly as there's greater uptake of the bureau services overseas. And then the all in EWS business, including the BPO operation, probably growing mid teens, the whole business should be probably a low double digit grower. And then as the work number mixes up, that's a margin tailwind because it's the most profitable segment in the company. We've foreshadowed this for a while, but transitioning into the risk category and not talking about upcoming risk necessarily, but something that happened in the past, the breach, it was huge. It felt like at the time it could have been a business killer. They've obviously rebounded and been fine with the aftermath. But can you just walk us through exactly what happened with the breach? in terms of what actually got (laughs) breached and leaked and then what the consequences were after the fact. Yeah. So in 2017, over a course of several months, Equifax was breached. Data on 140 million Americans was exfiltrated. Names, address, social security numbers, et cetera, but critically not credit card information. At this point, the now accepted hypothesis is that the hack was actually perpetrated by Chinese state-sponsored cyber thieves whose intention was to compile personal private information on U.S. government employees for espionage and blackmail purposes. And so because the credit card data was not taken and because large-scale commercial identity fraud was never committed in the aftermath, in some ways, Equifax kind of didn't dodge a bullet, but, you know, an atomic bomb because they could have been liable for a massive amount of identity fraud that really never materialized. Now, with that said, Equifax's data governance practices, I think, were very, very poor, leaving data unsegmented, unencrypted, so that a bad actor could come in and navigate throughout the IT residency and stack really unencumbered. Equifax went as far as to not renew a particular security tool that allowed them to monitor the state of their security protocols. And because they did not renew this encryption key, they couldn't detect the breach. So it was really basically a total shit show on Equifax's part. To add insult to injury, there were reports that certain level of the certain members of the executive team were familiar with what was going on well before it was publicized to the market and to the general public. And some of those folks sold stock. Ultimately, there's a few relevant outcomes of what happened with the breach. Number one, the former CEO, Richard Smith, was ousted. There were 
only one insider was actually charged with insider trading. So it wasn't an entire turnover of the executive staff, but there was a new CEO in place. Equifax ended up having to pay about $800 million in legal fines and to finance a consumer restitution fund. So those are kind of the direct consequences. But then downstream from that, number one, when the new CEO, Mark Begor, took over, I think he understood the promise in the workforce solutions business and EWS largely skirted by the breach and was not impacted. And so with the US Credit Bureau really hurting with the new leadership, Equifax really leaned into the work number business, which kind of from all dimensions is just objectively a much more attractive business than the Bureau right now. But I think Equifax had always identified itself as being a Bureau first and foremost. And so it precipitated kind of the resource allocation internally to focus on the work number. Secondly, Bigor also led this total IT stack rewrite. So Equifax will eventually, hopefully kind of in the next year-ish, be fully cloud native, have no on-premises data center footprint at all, and be fully in the cloud. And the company will talk a lot about how that should help them with new product velocity and the more ways that Equifax can, the more like kind of permutations of useful ways that Equifax can deliver its data to customers, particularly on the work number side, that will be very important for growing penetration and talent and government and mortgage and so forth. The investment in the cloud has totaled a billion and a half over the last five years. And so Equifax expects once that concludes that margins will come up, capital intensity will decline. And so it should definitely start to show up in the cost structure of the business at the time that it concludes. And I think we've talked a lot about the various risks that could be associated with this business and whether you would consider them big or small or overstated or understated. Do you think there's anything that we haven't touched on that would be a risk for this business? Of course, the one that's unpredictable would be another breach. I think on the competitive positioning, when you're placed very well, uh, things can't get much better. So competitive intensity definitely is increasing in the work number side. I still believe Equifax is well positioned to continue to compete, but directionally competitive intensity is increasing. I think another risk is just that Equifax has been quite aggressive with its pricing. And so I wonder to what extent that alienates customers. I think Equifax is, it's pretty well known. It's not a popular company, especially on the work number side. And so I think there is an appetite for alternatives. I just think the entry barriers are are so strong that customers haven't really gotten one. But I wonder if, for example, if background screeners and government agencies and the incremental mortgage originators who haven't adopted, they're hesitant to adopt because they know that Equifax will really exercise its position as a sole supplier. That would just be a headwind basically to the growth algorithm. A couple more. I think the cloud rewrite has taken longer than expected and been over budget. And it's not a make or break thing for the business, but the USIS and international margins are down clearly over the last five years. CapEx is up. And so I do think there's a bull bear debate about when, if, to what extent there's going to be an inflection in the cost structure. And we should start to see that later this year into 24, especially 25, 26, 27. The business should be at a more normalized, what it considers its steady state cost structure, which would be kind of high 30s plus margins, then leveraging off of that with the work number mixing up. And then the last one I think we haven't talked about is just could the work number come under regulatory focus, in particular, these exclusive contracts, because the work number just has such a strong position right now. I think, Matt, you alluded to it at the top of the episode. It kind of flies under the radar that this extensive database of most of our income and employment histories even exists. And the way it's facilitated is through these contracts that are exclusive. I do wonder to what extent that could be regulated. I'm not an antitrust expert, so I don't have 
very well informed opinion on that from what I've read and I understand I think the technicalities surrounding it. I think the arguments that Equifax would put forth is that it's a free market. Anybody can bid on the contracts. And the reason that Equifax wins them is because they have the verifier side of the network. Anybody is free to try to replicate that verifier side of the network. Of course, to build that network, you need the records, which is why it's such a defensive business model. I also think because the contracts are not perpetual, they come up for renewal. And then when you think about the fact that the exclusive direct corporate records There's no contract there. They're just kind of practically, but not contractually exclusive. So Equifax has, I'm estimating 40 million exclusive payroll records out of 220 million Americans who make money. In certain ways, you could frame it such that it doesn't look as monopolistic as it feels, I think, to a lot of customers. That makes sense. All right. We close out these conversations with lessons that you could apply elsewhere. What would you say? I think there's a lot of really interesting themes going on here with this business, but what would be your main lesson that you think you learned from studying Equifax? For me, what I felt was very useful was digging into all the revenue drivers, breaking down price times quantity. One of the wraps on Equifax is that there's just too many moving pieces in the work number side of the business. And I think it almost has like, I don't know if a complexity discount, but like a complexity barrier to investor interest, because you can go look at the investor decks they put out and they'll probably the most extensive, you know, (laughs) investor decks you've ever looked at. And there's just, it's kind of a very complicated ecosystem between the processors, the verifiers, the consumer, Equifax sitting in the middle, the different end markets. So I think there's a lot going on. And I think for me to get more clarity on how the business can grow for a long period of time at a healthy rate. It was very useful to think about price and quantity separately and how those differed by each of the end markets. And then I think the other thing, just to think through the incentives of everybody in the ecosystem, why would processors want to share exclusively? What would happen if records are shared with all vendors? Would the work numbers still have a credible case to stay at the top of the waterfall? So on and so forth. And just trying to think through additional consequences. And I think that's kind of consistent with there being a number of different participants in the ecosystem. The last thing that kind of interests me, I think Cliff Sosin, he said this either on business breakdowns or maybe another podcast he was on, but he talked about how businesses kind of stumble along until they find a position. And I think in some ways, Equifax, the talks business model, it almost came to be how it is right now on accident that it wasn't some grand plan. It was really very like incremental listening to customers saying, why don't you do this for us? Oh, now that we're doing it, why don't we flip our business model around? It wasn't some kind of stealth launch and grand plan. It just fell into where it is almost accidentally. Means there's a chance for all of us. (laughs) I love that. Well, this has been awesome, Mo. Appreciate all your insights here. It is a super interesting business from the outside, but even more so when you get on the inside. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Really happy to be here. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. A quick note before you go. We have been working with a handful of companies that expressed interest in hiring from the Colossus community. They have become design partners for us in what is a boutique recruiting operation. If you are looking to hire and would be interested in tapping into our community, check out joincolossus.com slash recruiting. We are taking another handful of businesses in and helping them out with our efforts. As you know, we take great pride in the quality of our audience. It includes some of the most successful people in the world, But it's also the curiosity, the ambition, identifying as a lifelong learner that we think really separates the audience. And we identify as all of those things ourselves. So again, make sure to check out joincolossus.com slash recruiting for more or check the link in the show notes.